Mark chapter 1, I want to begin reading verse 21, and uh, the focal point is going to be when we get down to verse 35, but the first few verses I want you to see because it reminds us of what a busy day Jesus had on the Sabbath day leading up to this verse we want to focus on. Beginning in verse 21 of Mark chapter 1, it says, and they went into Capernaum and, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet, come out of him. And throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed so that they debated uh, debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately the news about him went out everywhere into all the district of Galilee. And immediately after they'd come out of the synagogue, they came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And I I just got to tell you what's really cool about this is if you've been there, some of us have been there, some of us are going back in a few weeks, but in Capernaum, this little village, the synagogue where Jesus taught is just a stone's throw away from uh, this house of Simon, Simon who came to be called Peter. And so you just kind of picture this in your mind. So immediately they came, they were just right there and Simon's mother-in-law Simon uh, the mother of his wife was lying sick with a fever verse 30 and immediately they spoke to him about her and he came to her and raised her up taking her by the hand and the fever left her and she waited on them and when evening had come after the sun had set they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon possessed you get the setting of what's happened here Jesus had come Uh, into Capernaum and he began teaching on the Sabbath day and then when the sun set which that means that's when the Sabbath was broken then the people began bringing to him these others so the encounters he had with the unclean spirit and so forth that was in the synagogue but then the people began bringing these who were ill to him after the sun had set verse 32 Uh, they were bringing to him all who were ill those who were demon possessed and the whole city had gathered at the door And he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. He was not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he was. And in the early morning, while it was still dark, he arose and went out and departed to a lonely place and was praying there. And Simon and his companions hunted for him, and they found him and said uh, said to him, Everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go somewhere else. To the towns nearby, in order that I may in order that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Let's pray together and see this morning how we can apply this this truth and practice of godly solitude in our lives. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the picture of what Jesus did and and uh, all that he did. But even this uh, very specific moment when he understood the necessity, the value, the importance of getting alone with you and praying. Help us each individually to see how this applies to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We all can get there can't we? We all can get to the point where we're just flat worn out, just flat uh, exhausted from all that maybe has taken place in our life and all that's been going on. And, And we get to that point spiritually too. We get to that point where we need to recharge uh, where we have been uh, drained in so many different ways that, uh, that our soul needs replenishing. And, and that's what Jesus did. And listen, if Jesus knew the importance and the necessity of getting alone with the Father, how much more so do we need that? He recognized that it was an important thing for him, and, and so uh, we must do the same thing in our lives. Now let me explain to you why I call this godly solitude. Uh, before we move forward. I keep calling this godly solitude because it's drastically different 
than forms of uh, some forms of meditation or solitude, such as that of Eastern religions or meditation or or yoga, those types of things. The object of godly solitude is the Lord. You follow me? The object of this time of solitude, of getting alone with God, the object is the Lord. The object is never emptiness. The object should never be nothingness. And the object should never be self. So if your purpose in getting alone with the Lord is to empty everything in your mind and emotions and all that, mistake. If your purpose in getting alone is nothingness, just to have nothing, that's, that's wrong too. If your purpose in doing those things and getting aside is selfishly motivated, that's not right either. The purpose of solitude for those who are believers should be the Lord. It should be to get alone with him and to make him the focus of our time. And when we do that, when we empty our minds from the world, the purpose is simply to fill them with him, to fill them with him. So uh, understand that as we look at four principles this morning, four principles of godly solitude. Number one. It restores your soul with the provisions of God. It restores your soul with the provisions of God. You're familiar with Psalm 23. The psalmist David said, said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You know what it says after that? It says, He restores my soul. That's what the Lord does when we get alone with Him. Whether we realize it or not, We are all subject to spiritual emptiness. We are subject to soul burnout. And we can get there pretty quickly. Uh, We get depleted, just like driving a car when your tank is getting on empty. A lot of us spiritually live every day of our lives with the warning light on. Because we just refuse to stop and fill up. And, And... and, and I'm thankful that you're here this morning. This is an important thing. Gathering with God's people is an important part of how God has designed us to live in not only relationship with him, but in relationship with one another. But if the only time you fill up your spiritual tank is on Sunday, that's not good. You're going to run dry. You're going to run on fumes. It's important that we uh, have our soul restored by the Lord continually in our life and and time alone with the Lord refuels our soul the Bible says my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory but he waits for you to deliberately and intentionally allow him to fill you up and the way we get filled up is not always by more and more and more and more and more But it's by those alone times, by getting alone and eliminating some of those other things and allowing the Lord to be the one that we encounter. I'll come to some practical things, practical ways we do that in just a little bit. But secondly, godly solitude realigns our perspective. It realigns our our perspective on the day, our perspective on the week. Have you ever started out a week with, with all these great plants? And I know it happens because, I listen, I know you walk out of here on Sunday morning and you go, I'm going to be super Christian this week. And I'm going to do this, 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 and this. Well, usually by Sunday at lunch or Sunday evening or certainly Monday morning, your week's plans for your spiritual practices and the things that you're going to obey, the things you're going to do, usually pretty quickly they're derailed. <laughs> you're off track and you're like, well, uh, that's gone. I guess I'll wait till next Sunday to start over again. Well, you don't have to do that because time alone with the Lord helps you to realign your perspective. It allows us the opportunity to hear from God, to receive his instruction, to receive his direction. Well, notice this. After they had this time alone, it says they, probably uh, Simon and Andrew and James and John, but it says they went and found Jesus and they said, hey, everybody's looking for you. And don't you love Jesus for replies? He said, uh, let's get out of here. Well, that's not exactly what he said. He said, let's go somewhere else. It, it really, if you stop and read that, it's one of the funniest responses of Jesus in Scripture. 
Everybody's looking for you. He's like, well, then if they're looking for me here, then we're going there. <laughs> the reason he did that is he, he knew what his purpose was, and that's the third aspect we come to, is that godly solitude reminds us that we must strive to please God and not man. We must strive to please God and not people. See, just the day before, we read back in, in the verse 34, and so we read about Jesus casting out the demons, and, and uh, he wouldn't let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And then the next morning comes, the disciples tell Jesus, everyone's looking for him. Um, but they were looking for him because they knew what he could do for them. This is an important perspective I want you to get. The reason those people were were bringing the ill to him, the reason was they wanted the miraculous, they wanted the the visible demonstration of who he was and what he could do for them. They weren't going to him for who he was. They just wanted what he could do. Now, there's a difference. I hope you're following me. Everything Jesus did was intentional so that people would discover his divinity, so that people eventually would discover his identity. Not just so they would come to him for a handout. I hope you understand this, that the motivation for your time with the Lord, the motivation for godly solitude needs to be for who he is, not for what he can do for you. Let me say that again. Your motivation, our motivation, my motivation for godly solitude is to go to him for who he is, not for what we can get out of him. But if we don't spend time with him, we end up trying to please people, trying to satisfy everyone else's agenda, merely oftentimes reacting to the immediate and the urgent rather than being intentional in our purposes. Now, you might just this afternoon sit down and and look back over your last week and think, how many things did I do were intentionally led by God and how many of the the actions and reactions and things were were just those immediate, urgent things that somehow just took my attention away. Well, if you'll practice the presence of God, some of those fires, some of those immediate calls for your attention might be alleviated because you'll become a better husband, you'll become a better wife, you'll become a better parent, you'll become a better witness, you'll become a better friend, you'll become a better leader, you'll become a better employer, you'll become a better employee. And the list goes on and on and on. As we're guided by daily the agenda that God puts on our lives, we become more effective in everything we do. But if what drives us and motivates us is pleasing people, which oftentimes that's what the tyranny of the urgent is. You know, when people say, I got to talk to you, I got to talk to you right now. Well, is it really that urgent? Or is it just an interruption? I'm not talking about medical life-threatening crisis. I'm talking about something that, that maybe has gone on for six months, but then all of a sudden it becomes immediate. Well, it's not necessarily immediate. And everything that is immediately uh, or immediate and urgent for that other person might not necessarily mean that it is immediate and urgent for the agenda that God's put on your life. It's kind of a hard thing to understand, a hard thing to to spiritually grow to a level of maturity and discernment to understand, but we need to be guided by, we need to be driven by the agenda that he gives us in our lives. And now sometimes that uh, agenda is interrupted. Sometimes it's interrupted by Uh, his desire for us to see what he's doing in another direction. But the point being that when we spend time with him every day, our focus is to please him and not to just make people happy, whatever it may be. Number four, 
It, godly solitude, reminds us not to become complacent amidst the enemy's pursuit. You got that? It reminds us not to become complacent amidst the enemy's pursuit. While on earth, Jesus was flesh and blood. I think sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we say, oh, he's God. He was not subject to all that we were. No, but he was. He was subject to exhaustion just like we are. He was subject to physical, uh, uh, mental, emotional, spiritual exhaustion just like we are because he was fully uh, God, but he was also fully man. And Jesus had just spent, get this, Jesus had just spent the day with a bunch of people and had performed many miracles. He had taught in the synagogue. There were many victories that had been won, but those people were needy. They were taking from him. They were draining from him in many different ways. I want to let you in on a secret. Everybody, take your pen. I want you to write this down. This is, this is really, really important. People, people. I'm, I'm not names. Just, just, just say people. People can be invigorating and can fill your tank. But they can also exhaust you and drain you dry. You follow me? People, interactions with others, whether it's family, work, friends, crowds, whatever, people in some ways can be invigorating. They can give you life and energy and encouragement, but it can also drain you and leave you exhausted. And when you're exhausted, spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, when you're exhausted in any of those ways, any one or any combination of those ways, that's when the enemy sees you as vulnerable. That's when the enemy swoops in to attack. That's when you're susceptible because you're weak. Because here's what happens. We go, oh, man, we're, we're patting ourselves on the back about those victories from yesterday. You know, he the, could have been saying, oh, those, those demons were cast out. That great teaching, you know, those great services we had, those great victories. And then all of a sudden we're thinking everything's great. It's like, Lord, thank you for what you did for me yesterday. I got today. You take the day off. That's kind of what it's like. But when we're emotionally exhausted like that, spiritually exhausted, sometimes after a spiritual victory, because really the two kind of go hand in hand. Spiritual exhaustion is just as dangerous as spiritual victory. Spiritual victory says, I got this, I'm good. I'm good till next Sunday. I don't need to spend time with the Lord. I'm good for a while. Lord, you go take care of somebody else. They need help, but I'm fine. Well, that's dangerous. Just like exhaustion, on the other hand, is dangerous. And that's when the enemy swoops in. You know where Jesus was before he came to Capernaum? Do you remember? He had just been baptized and then spent 40 days in the wilderness facing the temptation of the enemy. So he knew... He knew what exhaustion was. He knew what spiritual, mental, physical, emotional exhaustion was when under the attack of the enemy. And he knew that those were the times because he had, he had been in that period of dryness, that period of intense fasting and depending upon the Lord when he, when he in every way was as weak as he possibly could, yes, was standing against the attack of the enemy. He knew how the enemy seeks to attack in those times in his life just as he does to us. So spending time with the Lord in prayer and his word heightens our alertness to the attack of the enemy. When we spend time here, it reminds us that we have a Savior who loves us and we have an enemy who seeks to destroy us. But if you don't spend time in his word, you just kind of go about his way or go about your own way through the week, you, you begin to get complacent to the way the enemy attacks. But the more often we're focused on truth, we have a heightened awareness to that which is false, to that which is deceptive, to that which is uh, deceitful. 
So how do we practice this godly solitude in our own lives? A couple of these might surprise you. Little encouragement or challenges that I want to give you, but here are four practical suggestions. The first one's not all that complicated. Choose a time and a place that you can consistently be alone with the Lord. This is practical now. Choose a time and a place that you can consistently be alone with the Lord. And don't say, uh, I'll see if I can work that out. Don't say, I'll see what I can do. Don't say, well, if I get around to it, then, oh, this 15-minute time slot over here might work. No, don't say that, but say, I'll do whatever it takes to meet with the Lord at that time, at that place. Now, that might change a little bit for you depending on your schedule. Some of you travel. You're in different places every day, different places every week. So for you, that might need to be adjusted, but make it your goal to set aside and make it your goal the night before. Don't wait till that morning, you're, oh, man, I'm so tired. Don't wait till that morning to decide what you're going to do, but the night before decide when that next day coming, when you're going to spend your time alone with the Lord. For some, it might be the same every day. For others, it might fluctuate a little bit, but make an appointment with the Lord and keep it. Doesn't it just drive you crazy when people make appointments and they don't show up? Doesn't it drive you crazy? You know what else drives me crazy? Some of you know this story. It drives me crazy to make an appointment and then you just have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait some more. I I had one of those appointments a while back. And I was there on time. Actually, I was there early. And I waited, and I waited a little bit more, and I got called back to the patient room. I thought, this is going to be all right. I'm only like five minutes behind schedule. This is going to be, this is going to be good. So I'm back there in the little patient examination kind of room, you know, and I waited a little bit, and I waited a little bit, and I could hear the doctor, and out here, it was nobody local, uh, but I could hear this doctor saying, oh, uh, out in the hallway, and I thought, oh, he's, he's about to be to me. Three hours later. True story. I can show you the text thread that I was keeping on my phone. Where, but my, the, probably the most frustrating thing is my phone was about to die. So I think I was, you know, and then you see the little sign on the wall that says, please do not use cell phones in examination room. What am I going to do? I've already counted all the lights and looked through the cabinets. I've done everything you can do. <laughs> and then he finally comes in. And says this, how's your day going? (laughs) And I, if I didn't believe in the security of the believer, I could have lost my salvation that day. I'm just saying, (laughs) it's very possible. But you know, when you make an appointment with the Lord, guess what he does? He's right on time. He keeps it. So we need to keep it. Number two, close all of your other apps. Get rid of all the distractions that are going on. Don't say, I'm going to have my time alone with the Lord, with the TV on and reading your daily devotional. This might be offensive to some of you, uh, but, but it's not your time. This, what I'm describing is not your time to read your daily devotional. This is not your time to, to read what the Uversion app description of the day is. This is not your time to share some cute picture of puppies that you saw on Facebook that made you feel warm and fuzzy and you thought, oh, that's going to inspire everybody else. That's not the kind of time I'm talking about. I'm talking about time alone with you and the Lord. And your time alone with, with the Lord involves, involves this. And I would tell you to you know, if you have the Bible on app or on a device or something, that's fine. Use that as a convenience. Some of you might need to use that because you can kind of backlight it. It helps you read or you can make the font larger. That's fine. But in your time alone with the Lord, get you one of these, an actual hard copy Bible. 
And here's why. By taking an actual Bible as opposed to an app, what you're doing is you're disconnecting from this digital world that consumes us through so much of our lives. And if you will disconnect from all those other things, from all those other distractions, and say, this is my copy of God speaking to me. It, it sets it apart in your mind. Is it symbolic? Of course. But it sets it apart. I mean, the, the, the Bible itself, it sets it apart from everything else that goes on in your life. Number three, as you do this, not only set a, a time and a place and close the other distraction, the apps, but start with 15 minutes. Start with 15 minutes. For some of you, that might be a major stretch. For others of you, you might say, well, I spend time with the Lord every day. Well, here's my question. In that hour or so you spend a time with the Lord, how much of that is reading words of someone else? How much of that is reading a devotional? How much of that is going down a prayer list? I'm talking about, and those are good things, but I'm telling you, 15 minutes, just you and his word in prayer alone with the Lord, you know, you won't regret it. I, let me make you this promise. If you will do that this week, I promise you will not regret it. If you spend 15 minutes alone with the Lord this week, and by next Sunday morning you go, that was a waste of time, please come see me next Sunday morning. We need to examine that. But you won't regret time alone with the Lord. You'll be amazed at how he multiplies your, your focus, your energy, how he makes the rest of your day more effective and efficient in ways like that because you've prioritized time with him. And lastly, consider that he desires time with you. You're not interrupting him. I told you about that three-hour doctor wait that I had. Let me just put it over the top for you. I'm not going to tell any of you who it is, so don't ask me. After he came in, three hours late, how's your day going? Gives me that deal. Then his cell phone rings, and he takes a personal call. And I, I still wonder why I did not get up and walk out. The Lord will never do that to you. When you say, Lord, here I am. You are his focus. Well, guess what? He's God, and he can focus on others but never at any point when you give him your attention will he turn his back on you. Never. And the incredible thing that happens as you prioritize him, time with him, solitude with the Lord, when you make that a daily discipline, you'll become so passionate about your time with him that you'll do everything you can to protect it. And you'll be willing to sacrifice other things that you previously saw as important. Those other things, you're like, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. You'll begin to push those aside, put those on a back burner, because you'll have such a passion for your time with him that you'll protect it from all of those other enticements. And that's the key is that those other things that take us away from the Lord, they're usually not bad things. They're usually good things. They're usually things that you're going to have to get to at some point. But if you'll prioritize him, you'll be blown away at how all those other things begin to fall into place. Even those unexpected things, unexpected on your 
calendar, the Lord knew they were coming. And sometimes you'll go, man, this crisis I face, that scripture I read this morning fits perfectly. You'll be amazed at how he's already prepared you for what's to come. Let me close with this story. You've probably heard me tell before. I've told it a a bunch of times, but there's a little boy who was going to bed at night. You know how kids do. They they uh, wait till the lights are off and they're in there by themselves and then they, they start asking for something. This little boy said, uh, uh, Dad goes and he sits down in the lazy boy. He's finally comfortable. He's got the remote. You know, he, everything is, life is good. And then he hears this voice from the back room. is, Daddy, Daddy, would you bring me some milk? So the dad gets up and he walks back there. He said, you've, you've already had some milk. It's too, it's too late. You can't have anything else. You need to go to sleep. So he goes back, sits down, turns lights off. A few minutes pass, and here's this voice from the back again. Daddy, Daddy, would you bring me a glass of milk? And Daddy goes back another time. He said, I told you, you're not going to have any more tonight. Dad goes back, sits down. Third time comes, the dad comes back, and he says, he says son, I told you, you're not going to get any more milk tonight. Now stop asking me. And if you ask me one more time, the next time I come back here, I'm going to give you a spanking. Yes, sir. So dad goes back and sits down. A few minutes pass. He hears this voice from the back. Daddy, daddy, when you come to give me a spanking, would you bring me some milk? (laughs) When we have the discipline and the desire to spend time with him, we become willing to sacrifice a lot of things. We're willing to say, hey, those things that we used to think were important, they're really not that big a deal. I'm more desirous of time with him. Why? Because I know he desires time with me. Get connected even more strong than you've been before in your daily walk with the Lord. Would you stand with me?